So thank you so much for the invitation to close out Open Repositories 2024. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I think it's the first time I've ever been able to give a keynote. So um, you know, checking this off my bucket list. And I hope I'm going to leave you with an inspiring message, really with the theme that I think repositories can be a very powerful tool for climate action. I want to start by thinking about how much information we have access to. And I'm old enough to remember in elementary school when I wanted to find information to have to go to the card catalog to find a book about the topic that I was interested in. And how much more information we have access to now in 2024. For example, I collect Godzillas, little miniature Godzillas, different types, different sizes, different variants of Godzillas. And you may be asking, why? Uh, and there's no good answer. I don't know. I just think they're kind of cool. And so when I go in and travel and, and talk about the Open Climate Campaign, which you'll hear about more later, I like to go and find a Godzilla figure to bring home. And so, you know, the first thing I did when I knew I was going to come to Gothenburg was, you know, Godzilla figure, Gothenburg. Um, and I went to the, the science fiction store, and they didn't have one there. And I went to the toy store, and they didn't have one there. So if you have... Uh, information, local information about where I can find one, please let me know. Um, this is not the most important part of the talk, but I really wanted to make sure that message came across. But there is more important information that we want access to, really around the knowledge of how the world works how the universe works, how we understand mechanisms and processes and phenomenon. And I want to really speak about a very tangible example. So in 1967, a scientist by the name of Ratcliffe noticed there was an increase in broken eggs in the nests of peregrine falcons. So what was happening is when uh, the males were sitting on top of the nest and they sort of they they left to forage the nest uh, eggs were broken and what that meant is that these eggs weren't going to sort of go to full term and result in cute baby peregrine falcons and the reason for that is tied to DDT or dichloral diphenyl trichloral ethane. DDT was a very popular insecticide, and particularly uh, because it's really good at controlling the growth and spread of mosquitoes, which often carry, at least in particular areas of the world, malaria. So what uh, mosquitoes do is, you know, they bite an infected person. It's an actual like parasite in the blood that then is inside so the, the body of the mosquito, goes and bites another human, and the parasite gets transferred. So less mosquitoes, less malaria. And this was a super effective tool in reducing the spread of these mosquitoes. So much, in fact, that a Nobel Prize was awarded for the development or the recognition of this, of DDT as a powerful insecticide. Except then it turned out that DDT was having some pretty deleterious effects on particularly birds of prey and the thickness of the shells of these birds of prey. And the reason for that is a phenomenon called bioaccumulation. The DDT was accumulating in the food of the food they were eating. So when you've got what we call multiple trophic levels, whatever content you have in the base level accumulates then in the next level, so the animal that eats that bottom animal. And as you go up trophic levels, that pesticide accumulated more and more until it got to the top predator, the peregrine falcon. And so 
what DDT does is that it prevents normal calcium production, causing those thin, fragile shells and the breaking of those shells when the adult falcon was sitting on the nest. This information was really crucial in understanding what was happening to these bird populations. Knowing the mechanism, knowing that the DDT was causing the fragility in the shells was so important to understanding why these populations were declining. It's a really great example of how the science was able to translate into an understanding of a problem and then leveraging that and translating that into policy. The research of this really catalyzed the early environmental movement. So um, this was mentioned in Rachel Carlson's uh, Silent Spring. And in 1972, the EPA canceled most uses of DDT because we had the science that helped us understand what was causing these deleterious effects in the birds of prey. We use knowledge to inform decision making, to help us understand the world, and to tackle the world's greatest challenges. But the truth is that we don't always have access to climate change knowledge. And I want, you, want to go through a couple of theoretical examples with you. So for example, like let's take a federal scientist. And they're interested in knowing about the preferences of lemurs uh, to specific trees. And it turns out this is true. Uh, uh, lemurs have a uh, predisposition to uh, live in certain species of trees, and they also have different preferences depending on the diversity or the number of different species of trees that are in a given area. So if they're tasked with the uh, proposal to create new habitat or protect certain habitat, this federal scientist would need access to a paper that had this information. And this paper really does exist. Like This paper with the information to be able to answer this question exists. We have produced that information. Or let's take another example, sort of more in the technology area. We've got a policy advisor who's been tasked to draft up a policy memo up to a minister. And they are tasked with the question, what percentage of energy demand can be met by wind power in Germany? Someone has done those calculations, someone has gotten the data, downloaded data, run models, and has specific information that can answer this question. They're in actual research publications. There's actual DOIs that have the answer to this, these questions. But what if I told you that your chances of having access to the answers, information that you need to be able to decide and inform the size of habitat and the diversity of tree species needed for a viable lemur population or making the case for wind power in Germany comes down to a coin flip. So what if I said, heads or tails? Oh, heads, no, no signs for you. And the reason for that is because all things considered in this sort of theoretical construct only 50% of research under the heading of climate change is open. So we worked with the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative to get this data. We've got 467 or so thousand outputs that are categorized under the um, climate change uh, concepts using OpenAlex. And about 
50% are open and 50% are closed. So if everything is evenly distributed, the chances of you being able to read a paper and get the information you need comes down to a coin flip. The paper on the lemurs was closed. The paper on the wind generation is open. And when you look down to the breakdown, it gives us a little bit of information, too, about what percentages are open um, through the repository and publisher. They don't all add up to 100 because there is some information where we're not sure if we can assign it to being provided by the publisher or uh, a repository directly. And I don't think it should come down to a coin flip. I don't think the future of the world, of our ability to solve the world's greatest problem, should come down to a coin flip. Sharing knowledge is a social justice issue. We should have access to this information. Everyone here in this room, everyone here in this country, everyone who is working on climate change, or just someone who is interested in knowing what is happening in their local community. They should not have to hit a paywall. They should not have to ask for a login from someone. We need quick access to that information. And so in 2022, we launched the Open Climate Campaign. The Open Climate Campaign's goal is to make the open sharing of research the norm in climate science. That if you're working on the world's greatest problem, then the knowledge about it has to be open. And we want to tackle that current status quo. We want to move from 50% towards 100% of research being open. And the way that we are doing this through this four-year project that is funded by Arcadia is through four programmatic areas. That one that we're calling the Advocacy Incubator, a Policy Lab, we're a Coalition Convener, and we're doing experimentation around what are other methods that we can advance access to climate change knowledge. So I want to tell you a little bit about our programmatic areas by giving you some general statistics. So we recognize that open access policies have significant impacts. 90% of work funded by the National Institutes of Health was, was open access as mandated by their policy. So just taking a snapshot of some data. Policies can be really powerful. If you have a policy that requires your grantees to make your work open, and you implement an equitable open access policy, you can drive change into the future towards open access. And so the Open Climate Campaign is working with national governments, funders, and environmental organizations to develop these open access policies with the lens of equity so that these policies are not only effective, but fair and contextualized to the country or region that we're working with, because we know they can be really powerful. As many of you know, open sharing is definitely not the default, and open science is actually still unknown to some researchers. Found a survey of uh, Polish researchers that indicated that 26% of the survey respondents had not heard about open science. And so we're also doing advocacy. We're going out and we're connecting with researchers and saying and, and reminding them, you're working on the world's greatest problem. We need you to make your work open. And we're going to connect you with resources. So we're not just going to tell them that open is important, we also need to enable open for them by connecting them with resources, many of which they still don't know about. There's still a lot of misinformation about open. They often still think that open means APCs, that open is expensive, 
And when you give them tools and free options, I think it really opens up the conversation and their minds to open. The importance of open is also not really recognized in some of these international frameworks and meetings around climate change. I attended the uh, 28th COP, the Conference of the Parties of the UNFCCC in Dubai last year, and there was only one presentation about the role of open in solving the climate crisis. You know, we hear a lot about the technology and the education and the innovation that we need to solve open. But I submit that none of that is open if we don't, none of that is possible if we don't have open, if we don't have access to that knowledge to mobilize that knowledge into innovations and technologies and education. So what we're doing is also convening organizations at the intersection of open and climate, organizations that are interested in elevating the role of open, surfacing it at meetings, at conferences, so that we get more of the climate change community, climate change decision makers, recognizing the role of open. Because I believe that that is also one way to change the culture of sharing around climate change research. But what else can we do? So these are some tried and true methods that I'm sure many of the folks here in this audience have done or have helped enable or have helped implement. What I'm really excited about at the Open Climate Campaign is some of the experimentations and innovations around how do we get outside, how do we get to some of these edge cases, how do we continue to innovate in this space? And this is the crux of what I want to talk to you about. What if repositories can be a tool of climate action? And maybe you already know that that's the case, but let's talk about that. Let's talk about how repositories can be a key in changing that coin flip and changing those odds. What if we could use repositories to remove those barriers, to increase those odds? If we leverage author accepted manuscripts and rights retentions policy and our knowledge of licenses and the infrastructure that this room has built and maintains and improves every single day. By helping us deposit manuscripts around climate change. So I want to introduce to you officially the paper pledge for the planet. So this is an initiative that we're launching at the Open Climate Campaign using tool, using repositories as a tool for climate action. The aim here is to encourage authors to deposit their paper in a repository, their climate change paper into a repository. So what do the steps of the pledge look like? Okay, so the first thing we're doing is we're identifying climate change publications using Open Alex. So as we mentioned, if you look at our, the entire corpus, we've got about 400, 400 almost 500,000 uh, outputs that are under the banner of climate change publication using our concepts tag. Then we're gonna separate that into a smaller tranche of papers. And the reason behind that is that we know that some of these older papers probably are not the best candidates for deposition because of the constraints of publisher requirements. So if you have a paper that's 20 years old, you're probably not going to find the author accepted manuscript version of that. It's probably on a typewriter somewhere. Um, so we're going to look at what's the low hanging fruit. We're going to start with papers from the last five years, where if we reach out to the researcher and ask them to deposit their climate change paper, it's more likely that we'll be able to find the right version of the manuscript as prescribed by the publisher and be able to assist them in depositing that manuscript into a repository. We're working with OA Works to get a lot of that interesting data. 
that is necessary to reduce that friction between authors and deposition. We're getting information about who the corresponding author is. And then we send them an email that says, again, you're working on one of the world's greatest problems, if not the greatest problem. You can, right now, upload a version of your manuscript, and we tell you the specific uh, format that that has to be in, and the license that gets applied. So with our partnership OA Works, we have all of that information. And that information is updated regularly. So OA Works knows when there's been a change to the policy because they have um, notifications when a change gets made to the journal's website. And so they'll go in and see if a policy change has been made. So it's up-to-date information. And once we've sent out that email, we also support authors in depositing likely their author accepted manuscript. In some cases, they'll be able to actually deposit the version of record in a small uh, number of cases. We have figures for that. And when we send that email, we also provide support for the deposition because we recognize that we really have to reduce that barrier or the friction between wanting to make your work open and actually going and depositing the manuscript. So we have a, a support person that is CC'd in that email in case they have any questions. Perhaps this is the first time they've ever heard about this. Perhaps they're skeptical. Um, the support through OA Works and the Open Climate Campaign will tackle that. So this is what what uh, the authors will see when they get an email, they'll get, they'll click a link that says, you know, to make your work open, click this link, and it will take them to an instance of share your paper on the Open Climate Campaign website. And it'll give you information and, you know, that you can freely share your paper because we're taking a tranche of papers that allows that. It will give information about the format that's required by the journal give you some information about, again, sort of what that formatting should look like, and then just ask them to upload the version of the manuscript, so probably, you know, uh, a Word doc or the equivalent up to that website. This is going to go directly into our Zenodo community, which is then discoverable by other tools like an unpaywall, the OA button, that makes what was paywalled um, now open. What I find really inspiring about this work at the Open Climate Campaign is that I think there's a lot of doom and gloom when we talk about climate change. I think it can feel at times really disempowering. You may think, what can I do as a single individual? Like vote, maybe recycle a bit, right? That's what we're told. And it just feels like there's not much that we can do. Except I am here to argue to you that you are in the best position to enable change towards climate change solutions and mitigations and understanding of adaptations. This is something that you as individuals in this space can do. You are well positioned to enable access to climate change research. I invite you to work with the Open Climate Campaign and do this type of work at your local institution or your local organization. And what we can do if we work together is you could get a list of the climate change publications for your particular institution, and we'll send that to you absolutely for free and say, here are our papers, and we could, you could let us know what range, date range you would want. Again, probably encourage you to do earlier papers that probably will have the most success. And you can then go and target researchers at your institution and have them deposit it into your repository. When we send out those emails, if we know the institution that 
the researchers are a part of. We'll invite them to deposit both in our Zenodo community and the institutional repository of the institution that they are in. We recognize the role and the important role of institutional repositories in enabling this change, because this is something that we can do right now. I would also like to encourage you to promote the pledge to authors and stakeholders at your institution. Because again, this is something we can do now. This is something that we don't need to wait for. Because the climate crisis can't wait for our business models to be sorted out. I know that's important work that has to be done. But that's going to take time. And climate change cannot wait. We need solutions and to better understand what is happening in our world because things are changing faster than even scientists five years ago thought they would. And so we need immediate access. We can't wait for 12 months. We can't wait you know, for um, the journals to open up the publications. We need to do something now, and this is something we can do. We're committed to leveraging open repositories as a tool for climate action. We want to work, from you, work with you and also learn from you. You know, the climate cl campaign is small, and there's a lot of knowledge in this room and a lot of potential in this room. We're seeking institutions who'd be interested in exploring a pilot project with us where we apply the paper pledge process to institution-specific papers. Uh, we can show you what it's like also to have a specific instance of share your paper uh, that goes directly into your repository. We're looking at ways in which we can reduce friction to this manuscript deposition because we can work you know, with these constraints to, to enable climate action. We, we can act now on this. There was a recent uh, publication from Catherine Hayhoe, who's the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy, and it's really all about you know, the doom that we're feeling in response to all the news we get about the climate crisis. And she argued that the solution to this doom is action. And this is action that you can do and that you are best equipped and you're the most knowledgeable to do. We can act now to help make climate change information and knowledge more open. It was a great talk uh, during this conference where the speaker said, like, that's probably why we are doing this work, because we believe that knowledge should be made open. This is what motivates us. And I hope that this feels like a call to action and something that you can do to tackle the climate crisis. So I invite you to join us. That's my email. Send me an email if you want to work together. Our website is the Open Climate Campaign. And we're using the hashtag Planet paper pledge to talk about this, because we also know the more folks know about the pledge, the more likely that they're going to go in and pledge their paper to address the climate crisis, to change those odds, to make climate change open, and to tackle the world's greatest challenge. So with that, I'll take some questions. We've just got our icons. <laughs>